morning, everybody. Um, so this ought to be fun. Um, although I will say our marching orders for this first hour and 15 minutes are fairly tall. So we're, uh, so I'm Jeff Aguirre. I'm a neurologist at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm Oliver Goodenough. I teach law at Vermont Law School. So our goal for the next hour and 15 minutes is to give you an overview of all of neuroscience from the macroscopic organization of the brain to the microscopic function of neurons, introduce you to the technology of neuroimaging, and then acquaint you with some of the inferential structure, the logic of making claims using these techniques. So that's a fair bit to cover. And adding to that, I'm going to try and, and, and add a little bit to the, some of the framing discussions you've heard already. Uh, uh, he is, in, in the, the terms of football um, uh, commentators, he's, he's, he's the guy who, who gives the play-by-play, -play and I get to be the color commentary. As we go <laughs> <laughs> so let me get this started up. And I think uh, Oliver had some opening remarks for us. It's going to motivate and frame our discussion. And there we go. There we go. OK, I want to start out with a, a, a quote that I came uh, somebody uh, introduced me to recently, uh, which I think is an, is an interesting one uh, on uh, uh, following up on, on some of the points you've heard earlier about, about psychology and, and uh, 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 effective action in, in the world of, of policy. Uh, this is from uh, John uh, Maurice Clark, uh, 1918, Journal of Political Economy. The economist may attempt to ignore psychology, but it is sheer impossibility for him to ignore human nature. If the economist borrows his conception of man from the psychologist, his constructive work may have some chance of remaining purely economic in character. But if he does not, he will thereby avoid not avoid psychology. Rather, he will force himself to make his own, and it will be bad psychology. And indeed, what what uh, uh, let me make sure that okay. Uh, uh, what, what I view uh, is, is that law can be viewed usefully as applied psychology, in the same way that engineering can be viewed as applied physics or applied chemistry. Uh, we are, in some ways, the, the engineers of, of, of psychology. Uh, 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 and uh, it, we are concerned with influencing human decisions and behavior. That's what we're, in, we're, we're concerned with in the law. And this is the subject matter of behavioral science generally and of psychology in particular. Uh, Justice Liu and I tried this out on him yesterday, uh, pointed out, by the way, economics, sociology, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I, I take that all on board, that it's not simply limited to psychology. We are, we are interested in a broad range of, of social science in the same way that an engineer would be interested in a broad range of physical science. But nonetheless, I think there is a particular salience to psychology in what we do. And indeed, we can think of economics and sociology as branches of psychology in that same kind of sense as well. So. We can contrast um, uh, two kinds of approaches we might take in this. One we, I might call the essentialist philosophical approach versus a, the, the, the realist approaches. The US realist tradition in which most of us live as, 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 as uh, certainly legal scholars and as, as uh, legal um, um, uh, practitioners is that we look at actual causes and effects. That we do not view uh, um, 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 a right and wrong as simply a matter of, of some kind of essentialist calculus. But we are interested in what actually works. This was the great realist uh, uh, um, um, revelation. I contrast Bob Dole um, uh, in, in his campaign for presidency uh, and, and his comment on drugs at that time. He said, when asked about his drug policy, he said, there is right and there is wrong and drugs are just wrong. Now, you know, that's, I, I'm not saying that's an undefensible position, but I am saying that, that it doesn't then lead you to concerns about, well, what might work in terms of, of, of drug interaction, the kind of thing that, that, that Judge Davis was, was saying, you know, well, you know, we now know that in, in, a, in a treatment program there's, you know, failure, yes, uh, good days, bad days, you know, the, the kind of data-driven analysis that, 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 that we, many of us at any rate, feel can, can helpfully inform our decisions around how policy goes forward. And even essentialists have, a, a, have a, a, a psychological model. It's typically just not very well examined. Uh, there, there, is a, there is an embedded psychological model. See, see um, uh, the quote we, we started this with. Now, so what are the categories for, for psychologies of law? And I'm going to give a, a very gross generalization here. Uh, there's the traditional folk psychology, uh, humans as intentional agents responsible for their actions. Stephen Morse uh, has been a, 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 an effective and strong proponent. We, we have discussions going back and forth on this. But, but essentially, this is this notion that, that humans are agents. We can affect their behavior by, 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 by changing their incentives. They'll act in a, in a, in a, in a, um, uh, um, a way that's responsible for their actions. I think this is actually a reasonable approximation in many cases. I don't think it's inherently right. I just think that it is one of those things that actually maps pretty well onto what, what, what people do at least much of the time. 
Another model, Homo economicus. This is uh, the law and economics model. Uh, humans as self-interested rational actors. Um, uh, uh, and I think this one is a reasonable approximation in a more limited number of cases. Again, it does a pretty good job in certain kinds of uh, econ explicitly economic exchange kind of uh, venues, but it doesn't, it doesn't get into the richness, which I think we, we, we feel we need to see more. Um, there's behavioral psychology. Behavioral psychology is the traditional psychology of the, of the 20th century. Um, humans as a bundle of behaviors. And again, I, I, it's my own take on this that, that this has been descriptively very useful. It's descriptively careful. It, it has, 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 has looked into behaviors. But I think it's been causally poor. And I, 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 the, 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 the analogy I, I, I use, and some accuse me of overusing, is that imagine a behavioral auto mechanics. Okay? We know, if you, get in, if you don't know anything about auto mechanics, you can get into a car, you can drive it, you say, oh, I push this thing down, it goes, I turn this, it turns. You know, there's a whole set of things that we can learn that are useful and, and give us at least a certain approach to this kind of thing. But also imagine that we then try, something goes wrong. Yeah, 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 the, the, the car has decided to stop working. Uh, you know, my own response in those circumstances might be pound on the hood. I don't know. You know, they, 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 you don't know what to do when it goes wrong in that kind of a context. So again, I think it's useful. To, you know, behavioral psychology very useful in lots of ways, but 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 not necessarily getting all the torque you could. So it's one damn thing after another. Almost any explanatory argument is plausible. In, 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 in biology, this is sometimes called just so stories. We can invent just so stories about why, when, when, when something goes wrong, it went wrong. The motive, the motive um, uh, uh, impulse of the automobile has been diverted. And it's not going anymore. Its motive impulse has been diverted. Well, that, you know, that's okay, but it doesn't give me anything. And at least that, it's my, 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 I, I feel at least some of the explanations of traditional behavioral psychology had that kind of flavor to them. Uh, so what I suggest is we need to get under the hood to get to a better psychology, and that's what I think neuroscience allows us to do. The core, to me, the core piece of neuroscience is the expectation that we, by examining the physical nature of our mental processes, we will understand them better. If we can get to the physical nature of the processes, the, the, it's not a one-to-one -one matching. I'm not saying that it's going to tell us everything. But if we can begin to say, this is what mental processes look like as they physically work, we will get a better understanding of them as they go forward. Uh, uh, it, it, it's, the, the opening assumption is a, a link between the physical and the mental. Again, there are people who say that that is not true, that you know, uh, uh, the, Descartes, the Cartesian kind of world where it's out there in the ether someplace. Uh, but I'm not that of that opinion. I think that there is, at the very least, some interaction that is useful to have between the physical and the mental. And we now, as, 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 as Owen has uh, uh, reminded us, we have some tools to get into that black box of the brain. We have, in particular, you're going to hear about these tools. You're going to hear a lot about imaging techniques. Uh, imaging techniques are very important, but they're only one of the set of techniques that we have to do that. Uh, there's a set of electrical measurement techniques uh, uh, that, that you saw in some, some of the evidence that Owen was showing was, was essentially electrical um, activity mapping. And then neurochemistry. Neurochemistry is in some ways, I think, the forgotten element in, sometimes in this, and in things like drug addiction, a very, very important uh, element in, in how that all works. So we've got ways of measuring across these. We've got some other, other uh, entry points in as well. Uh, those entry points are, are to some degree in early stages. You're going to hear some wonderful things about how they work and how they, what their limits are. But but this is a set of techniques that allows us to get back to that notion of analyzing the physical nature of, of thought and cognition. And as we do that, we inform our psychology. By the way, we're not forgetting about behavioral psychology. You'll hear behavioral experiments suggest great things. They, they, what's fabulous is when you start to, to, to cross-fertilize back and forth between what people are doing, good old-fashioned behavioral um, uh, observations, with the, the, the physical mechanisms of the brain. And each of these then reinforming each other and getting a better and clearer understanding of, of just what is going on when we, when we think and act. Um, so, uh, applications, what does it add? And this is a, my last point before I turn it over to, to Jeff to, to, to get you into the, into the science a bit. What does it add? The first thing I would say is that from my standpoint, it's most additive where current approaches are working poorly. There are areas of the, of the law, there's doctrinal areas, where it actually is working pretty well. You know, the, 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 uh, some areas of criminal law, I think, think work, work pretty well. 
And those, why, why spend a lot of time on them if, if we've managed through, through, through our trial and error processes, through traditional psychology, if we've got something that's working pretty well, let's leave it alone. Let's not, not necessarily go there with, with, with uh, neuroscience. But I have the, the Sandra Day O'Connor comment. Sandra Day O'Connor was, was the um, uh, honorary um, a chair of the advisory committee for the first uh, iteration of, of the, the law and neuroscience program. After one of the programs, uh, 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 the meeting of the network she came to, she came to a few of us and basically, in fact, uh, Monica Cheney grabbed her by the arm and said to her, we need law and neuroscience. And she mentioned three areas where she thought we particularly needed law and neuroscience, and they're my first three here. She said that law is not working particularly well around drug addiction and enforcement, around the approaches to juvenile, and around mental health. You know, that that's a list of three areas where I think, you know, the current approaches are not working as well as we think they should. We can argue back and forth about the clauses. Hopefully we will get a lot of, 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 of information on the table about that. But I think it's a fair <laughs> starting point to say, at least in those areas, we, 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 you know, most of us would say, yeah, we could learn something. Maybe this is a, an area where we can go to learn some of them. Now, how do we put it into, how do we put this information to work? Because this is, this is my last point. First of all, I think there are, are kind of three layers in this. There's the layer of general policy. What are we going to do about something like juveniles? What are we going to do about something like, like drugs? Should we throw the book at people? Should we have an approach that attempts to, to treat it more like, like, like a, 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 men, a medical problem? You know, there, these, are, these are questions we can argue back and forth about. But we have that kind of, of notion, and again, uh, here, we're just general punishment problems. And this is an area where, 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 which we traditionally think of as both societal, if society makes up its mind that it wants to be more punitive, well, we're going to be more punitive. Um, uh, and legislative, to some degree, in interpreting that through, through, through legislation. Not so much the traditional judicial uh, area, although I'm a, a, a believer that, that in the U.S. The, 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 the lawmaking power in a common law system is not restricted to the legislature. That's uh, perhaps a, 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 a bit of a gauntlet to throw down, but I think that we have a common law system. You know, we have a system in which, in which um, uh, uh, that, that power is at least partly shared into the judiciary. So, um, uh, but then we get down to specific doctrines. Okay, we've got this kind of uh, layer of, 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 of policy, specific doctrines. And this is, I think, explicitly both legislative and, and judicial, that we're going to shape our doctrines, you know, that this is an area. And what are we going to do? Well, again, see some of the above. Uh, you know, these, these are our areas not just of general policy, but how do we deal with, 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 with um, uh, uh, people on a probation uh, basis? Do we have reentry courts? Do we have these kinds of things where we, where we, we, we work with that? And then there's going to be specific cases, and this is typically specifically judicial. Um, individual criminal capacity is something we may be called on to make individualized judgments about. Um, pain assessment or truth-telling, these, these are areas that both operate up here, but then we're going to be making specific um, judgments about. So the questions of how, where are we going to be most successful with law and neuroscience, I actually work back up this chain a little bit. I think specific cases are hard. You're going to hear more about that. Um, I'm not saying there isn't some information that's useful, but I think it's harder here. I think that as we work up this chain, we actually get perhaps more use, utility of, of the neuroscientific um, um, evidence and, and uh, that we can begin to say, okay, as a society, yes, it's hard to make this decision about the particular drug offender, but maybe across a whole class of people, we understand them better and we can have policies that at least at the gross level will begin to, to give us better results than the ones we have. So that's my, 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 my framing and introduction, and I turn it over to the scientist who's going to, to take you through, through the science. All right, let's talk about the brain. So, um, uh, you know, in his opening remarks, Owen uh, motivated some of the interest in, what do we have here? Oh, thanks. I don't think it'll click on mine, but I can wave it around authoritatively. Um, <laughs> so in his opening remarks, Owen did mention, uh, or motivated some of the interest in uh, neuroscience and brain imaging by giving some examples of all the places where it seems to be cropping up in sort of day-to-day -day, uh, discourse and in the lay press. I'm going to add my most recent example of this while flying out uh, on a recent trip uh, to give one of these talks. Looking through the Sky Mall catalog, I came across this product, which looks nice. It's a stand magnifier. Here's somebody in the retirement community in Florida enjoying reading some article. If you zoom in, they're reading about the brain. So that is the, the article in the Sky Mall catalog the guy is reading is some brain activation study. So you know your field has peaked when it's appearing in the Sky Mall catalog. So, uh, you know, from that sort of simple, just boy, how pervasive is this neuroimaging stuff example to one a bit more specific to this audience. And again, adding to some examples that Owen provided before. So here's a motivation of brain imaging appearing in the courtroom again, yet another one uh, to think about, and one that I'll return to a couple times as I go through these remarks. So uh, this gentleman here is Brian Dugan. Um, uh, he was uh, in 
To make a long story short, in 2009, he was in the sentencing phase of a capital murder uh, case, or a capital uh, trial case, and an expert witness, Kent Peel, testified on behalf of the defense and introduced brain imaging data that suggested that Brian Dugan uh, was a psychopath based upon the brain imaging data. Now, whether or not that should actually uh, help mitigate his responsibility, or uh, <laughs> I'm not quite sure how that was to be interpreted, but at least uh, the idea was that based upon some brain imaging measures, one could determine that this individual, um, Brian Dugan, was a psychopath. And so that's a kind of claim that we're going to return to and try and deconstruct. So what is the what are the raw materials that went into generating these kinds of pictures and then making this claim about the nature of his internal mental or behavioral state? So let's talk about the brain. One of the one things we want to do is go through a tour of the organization of uh, the central nervous system from macroscopic down to microscopic. My goal here actually is to provide largely a cartoon level account of the organization and properties of the system, but with an occasional peek behind the curtain at all the levels of intricacy that go deeper than that, just to give you a sense of the horror of all the, the minute details that I'm, I'm uh, sparing you. So, okay, well, let's start with then just some terms of anatomy and organization, just so we're using a common language over the course of the next couple of days. So um, we're going to take this brain and uh, then take what's called a coronal slice, so a crown-like orientation slice down through the brain. And then now that's one of those views, a cross-sectional view through the middle of that. And so in that cross-sectional view of the brain, you can already appreciate a couple of the macroscopic structures and terms that will come up as we, as we go through this. As you know, the brain is wrinkled. It's thrown into folds. The, uh, the extension of a wrinkle is called a gyrus. The depth or the valley is called a sulcus. And so those are illustrated there. And then just one thing that's very obvious, just on a macroscopic level of the organization of the brain, is that there is gray matter and white matter. And so gray matter is one uh, substance that coats around the outside or surface of the brain. And white matter is what's present deeper in. And so in a moment, we're going to hear about what exactly that gray matter and white matter is composed of. You know, another term for this outer layer of gray matter is the cortex, which is from the Latin for bark, like the bark of a tree, so the thing that's the covering on the outside. And inside the cortex resides, primarily, the cell bodies of, of neurons. And so let's now zoom way, way on into the microscopic level and take a look at some of these individual cells that make up the nervous system in the brain. So again, a cartoon representation of a neuron. This is the central unit of uh, information processing in the brain, right? So to a first approximation, the nervous system is composed of neurons plus some other stuff. But the, but the neurons are the ones where most of the action happens for uh, processing of information. So a neuron has a cell body. This is kind of like the bioenergetic uh, factory for the cell. This is where proteins are made and energy is consumed and uh, most of the, the machinery of the cell operates. Uh, so that's the cell body. You can think of a neuron as having basically an input and an output end. So the input end are the dendrites, which in this cartoon cell are up at this end. And then there is an axon, which is a long projection of the neuron, ending at uh, connections, which we'll come to in a moment, called synapses. Okay, So there's the cell body. That's the energetically active factory part of the cell. The extension of the axon, and then finally at the end where it makes connections, synapses. So coming back to that... Um, uh, coronal view of the whole brain, I just want to position for you roughly kind of how axons fall in here. This is to, again, a first approximation cartoon version. You can think generally of the organization of the, of the brain being that the cell bodies of neurons are located up in the cortex, and the white matter is composed of these long extensions of axons, the projections or connections of a neuron going off to communicate with other neurons. Okay? Now again, Things are much more complicated than this very simple view. In fact, the cortex has multiple layers. Those layers actually have lots of different neurons, and they're interconnected to one another, both within a layer and between layers. And, uh, and then moreover, there's many, many different types of neurons with different uh, types of arrangements of dendrites and um, the sorts of projections that they make. So there's an awful lot of variability here. But again, to a first approximation, a neuron is the central processing unit of information in the brain. The cell body is located up in the, in the cortex. And the white matter is composed then of those long axons going to connect to other neurons. And by the way, feel free to jump in. And I'm, I'm going to just because I'm going to increase the cartoon here for a moment by, by suggesting that if you think about this, uh, if, if, uh, and this is a, a, a personification that you will, will not necessarily endorse, think about yourself as the neuron. Okay, how is it you're getting input? 
you're get, basically you've got all of these, these interconnections out there. And as input comes into you, if it becomes if excitatory enough, then you fire out to everybody else in the network. So there's this kind of threshold of, of excitement and, and the, uh, uh, that, that has to be reached. And then the neuron becomes then the communicator to the next one. So if, if, if the table is here, you're all sort of connected to each other. You know, you're kicking each other a little bit. If you give each other a big, strong kick, then, oh, OK, then you kick down the, the chain. So you get the, in this, and thinking is often, or, or I shouldn't say thinking, I apologize, mental processes through, through our, 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 our neurons is often this kind of cumulative cascade kind of thing. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Oh, it matters. And then we, we push it down, down the tube. Is that mm -hmm. fair? Yeah, no, fair enough. Let's act, and we can see that then in a little bit more detail if we okay. dive in, right? So um, the, the basic then function of a neuron, the basic thing that it's doing is uh, firing off what are called action potentials. So an action potential is a, an electrical event that occurs in a neuron, which is the transfer of information down along the, uh, the neuron to the next neuron, OK? And so just, again, in a cartoon form, the way this goes is that the neuron receives some kind of excitatory input at the dendrites, right, at the input end. And we're going to talk about what that excitatory input is in a minute. But OK, so some kind of excitatory input comes on in. And if there's enough of this excitatory input, if it crosses a threshold, as Oliver suggested, then what happens is that the cell body uh, generates what's called an action potential. This is an electrical depolarization. This is a wave of sweeping electrical activity, which then travels down the axon all the way down and then reaches into the point of connection that that axon has upon the next neuron. In fact, you can then think of the nervous system as being these chains or sort of networks of neurons connected together with the output end of one uh, axon of a neuron plugged into the dendrite to the input end of the next uh, neuron. Ooh, plug, plugged in? Well, we'll come to it, okay. but at least connected up next to it. Um, uh, and that this kind of network then and the transfer of information across this network is the, is the the work or activity of the nervous system, OK? So axons connect the dendrites to form networks of neurons. And then let's focus in a little bit then at this site of connection, OK? The point of that connection is called the synapse. That's the point where the axon of one neuron comes up next to the dendrite of the next neuron. And that's where the magic happens, right there at the synapse. So we're going to focus in now right at that point and see what we got. So here comes the. Uh, the one neuron, its axon, which travels all the way down and gets real close to, but not quite in contact to, the dendrite of the next neuron in the chain. Okay. Uh, 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 so if we're commu uh, I, I said we'd be kicking each other. That we're actually not, because if you, if 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 if, if that is the nature of the connection between neurons. The key to your room back at the hotel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Which, 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 which has actually a, a significant yes. impl implications. If we were just directly plugged to each other, the, electri the electricity would go, well, OK, there we'd, we'd go. I, I think it's even closer to like a seventh grade dance where you get close. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to keep a couple of right. So in any event, so we have um, the axon of one neuron getting close to the dendrite of the next. And so then here's what happens. Right down here at the end of this axon uh, are uh, little microcellular structures called vesicles. They're basically little bubbles. And inside each bubble, is a collection of neurotransmitter. It's a chemical, right? So it's the chemical that is going to be the means of communication from one neuron to the next. And then on the receiving end, at the dendrite of the next neuron, there are all these lined up receptors, basically little catcher's mitts, waiting to catch that neurotransmitter. And so when an action potential travels on down the axon, it moves those vesicles up towards the end, and then the vesicles break open and kind of pass along that neurotransmitter, which then uh, diffuses across this little gap into the receptors. Okay, so the action potential zoom comes down to the end of the axon, and then it hits. It's like, okay, now get the bubbles up to the end, open on up, spread the neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter diffuses across the little gap and into the catcher's mitt. Okay, and when those receptors at the second neuron receives the neurotransmitter, this then, for example, produces an excitatory effect upon that next neuron, and then on down the chain. Okay. So the point here, then, is that there's this rapid uh, electrical activity that zooms down the length of the axon, right? So there's this rapid electrical communication, which then ends with a little chemical puff onto the next neuron. The next neuron says, oh, that was a pretty good chemical puff, and then on to the next action potential, and so on and so forth. OK, so that's the chain of communication as we move on down. Is now, this observable, or is this? Oh, this is highly well observed. So the, the details of this are known to an astounding degree of, um, uh, of precision in terms of the precise molecular forms of these different receptors, the, the forms of the neurotransmitters, 
the molecular activity that results in all this happening, boy, is that well articulated. So, um, and again, just to give you this, the briefest glimpse of the yeah, details beyond. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you're, I was really with you until your first diagram made it super clear and everything just nailed what I thought I understood. Okay. Because your very first diagram was gray matter and white matter. You have your gray matter consistent with white matter. White matter consistent Not, not quite right. Yeah, the, the, not quite right. The so the, the way it works is the white matter, you can think of the white matter as all those telephone cables, all those long axons. So you have uh, cell bodies located at different spots in the cortex, and those, those neurons want to communicate with one another. So they send off a long connection down into the white matter and then up to the, to the cortex at another spot where that's where they're going to find some dendrites of another neuron to communicate so with. The dendrites are not, there are no dendrites in the white matter? Uh, let's say no. <laughs> it's axons. Let's say yes. No, let's, let's say no. No, the, 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 white the white matter is composed of axons. The white matter is composed of axons. It's the, it is the, the long, I mean, so in that cartoon I showed earlier, let's get back to the, the bigger picture view, okay? Here is like a chain of kind of closely positioned uh, neurons. But you can imagine these axons can go on for feet, actually. I mean, these axons can be incredibly long. In fact, there is just a single neuron, right, with one very long axon, which goes from, the, from your motor strip, the part that controls motor activity here in your brain, down, 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 into your spinal cord, where it, where it connects to a second neuron that then goes out to the muscle to make it act, okay? So these axons can be remarkably long. Um, but in... Sketch, right. which showed the location of the right, the rejection distance from synaptic gaps. Synapses, okay. Yeah. It, it's, it looks like, and maybe I just can't get my head up, but it looks like they uh, synapses are geographically localized. Dendro dendrites are geographically localized. But I, I can't I, see if there's. Uh, well, no, um, so the dendrite and the, the synapse is just the name of where an axon and a dendrite come together. Right, go back, can, can you go to Sure. Okay. okay. You want this one? Gray matter, white matter. Gray matter, white matter. Okay. So this is again like a very rough cartoon, um, and but okay. so what I should have drawn is this axon curving around and probably coming back to here, say, okay. or going all the way across and then over to the other side. Okay. And yeah. there are also some more, much more localized links as well. It's not it's not all all just a crossover, but but um, there, there's local links and then there's the long distance links. Yes. Okay, here comes the variety. Thank you for the segue. So it turns out um, it, things get complicated. That's right. <laughs> things get complicated real fast. So there are lots of different types of neurotransmitter, right? So there's lots of different types of chemicals that could be contained within those vesicles. And so these, this uh, bestiary of different neurotransmitter chemicals is one major source of the variety of function that we have across the nervous system. And then, in turn, these different types of neurotransmitters are unevenly distributed around the brain, right? So some areas of the brain have more of one type of neurotransmitter delivery or receiving than other areas of the brain. I'm just going to mention some of the names because they're going to come up again over the next few days. But things like acetylcholine and serotonin, dopamine, which will be a big one when uh, you folks talk about addiction a little bit, GABA, glutamate, norepinephrine, there's all these different sorts of neurotransmitter, okay? And then the details precisely of how they're distributed, where these neurotransmitters are generated, it gets into an awful lot of uh, real messy detail. Um, the only thing I would add to this is that, that while we've talked about the neurotransmitters being released across the gap, they're also swimming around as well. Uh, so, so, so that, for instance, if you, if you um, uh, um, uh, uh, serotonin, serotonin reuptake uh, inhibitors are, are, are the classic, a classic treatment for depression. One of the things they do is, is, is when you're done with this little communication, the, 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 they, get, they get typically sucked back in to refuel the whole process. Mm -hmm. If you inhibit the getting sucked back in, you've just upped the effect of any release. 
because there's already additional stuff floating around in there. So, so, so again, you can reset uh, different, different, different moods, different uh, uh, neurochemistry uh, ad additions you've taken mm -hmm. to, to apply to yourself can 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 affect a, a change in, in all of this by changing the 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 the, the climate within which the, that transmission takes place. Absolutely right. So uh, drugs that affect things like migraine headaches, epilepsy, depression. All of these are medications that are affecting aspects of these neurotransmitter systems, either the receptors that catch them or aspects of the production of the neurotransmitter. So uh, manipulating this part of the system is the key aspect of an awful lot of pharmacology of manipulation of the nervous system. And just again, like things become more complicated still, it turns out there's different types of receptors. Some of these receptors are excitatory. Some of these are inhibitory. They actually calm down the neuron that receives these inputs. You even have complicated things where receptor has other receptors on top of them, so you get dendrites that are modified by one and then inhibited by another. So uh, the amount of variety and the degrees of freedom available to these sets of nerves to have different kinds of patterns and behaviors is enormous, okay? So it's far more complicated than the simple, you know, it, neuron one fires that makes neuron two fire and then on you go. Actually modeling and getting all the detail right about this is an enormous enterprise, and that's why neuroscience is hard. Okay, so in addition to uh, all this generation of action potentials and electrical activity and moving transmitters and all the rest, to, to fuel all this activity, neurons are very metabolically hungry, okay? In fact, this is a, uh, a very large proportion of the metabolic, sort of the energetic requirements of the human body are uh, driven by the consumptive action of the nervous, the central nervous system, okay? So neurons uh, take in oxygen and glucose and then use that as their metabolic fuel right to provide this operation and these neurons are continuously metabolically active and that metabolic activity principally happens at the cell body okay so that cell body that's where the crank is going that's sort of turning all the metabolic machinery that keeps these cells running okay so the, the cell bodies of neurons are always consuming oxygen and glucose okay so just to give you an interim summary at this point okay the cortex that's the gray matter contains neuron cell bodies. Uh, the white matter contains axons. That's the connection from one neuron to another or one patch of cortex to another. The cell bodies consume glucose and oxygen. They're very metabolically active. All right. And the neurons communicate electrically and then chemically. Right? So that's the, the two-step two dance of neuron communication. OK? We doing all right so far? All right. So. Let's zoom way back out again to look again at the macroscopic organization of the brain. Now we know a little bit about the constituent parts that make up this system. So first I want to give you the grand tour, the grand tour of the specialization of the organization. And boy, this is really going to be fairly cartoonish, but I think, uh, as I'll illustrate in a moment, a lot better than a lot of the sort of folk psychology sayings about how the brain is organized, and we'll come to those. So okay, so I've been showing you a side view of the brain primarily. So this is the front of the brain up here. Your eyeballs would be back around here. And this is the back, so back around here. So that's just the side view. Of course, we could also take the brain and sort of turn it around and see the medial view or the middle view. This is the view you would get if you took the brain out, cut the connection between the two hemispheres, and then look down at that exposed piece, OK? So that's a view of the brain from the middle or medial side. So um, as you can see again, the brain is thrown into these, uh, these wrinkles, which are called the gyri and the sulci. And um, by convention, certain large sections of the brain, certain big regions referred to as lobes, are given particular names. And we can talk about the, generally the specialization or function of these different big lobes or areas of the brain. Okay? So one lobe we can, we can identify is the occipital lobe. So the occipital lobe is this one region which is in the back, and it has a specialization for vision, okay? There's another big lobe, the parietal lobe, which is up top here. It has functions primarily in attention and spatial representation, primarily, okay? Is it on both lobes? Yes, this is by, what I'm saying so far, by the way, applies to both hemispheres of the brain, yeah. to the left and the right. In a moment, we'll come to like a whole left-right thing. People love the left-right stuff, okay? <laughs> oh, I love it again so far. <laughs> <laughs> So the frontal lobe generally involved in language production, planning, and lots of other complicated higher level functions. Okay. I get to be Vanna at the moment. Yes. <laughs> That's right. Very good. My lovely assistant. Um, and you'll be hearing an awful lot about the frontal lobe as, uh, as the next uh, day or so goes by. And then finally, the temporal lobe, which has many th different functions, but mainly the thing that this audience will be interested in over the next day or two is memory. This is sort of the spot where 
a lot of the memory systems of the brain are located. Okay? So what I wanted to offer you is just like the, the broadest kind of divisions or way of thinking about the organization of the brain, left, right, top, bottom, back, front, that kind of thing. So the most obvious macroscopic feature of the brain is that it has a left side and a right side, right? That there are these two hemispheres, right, or sides of the brain. And generally speaking, uh, for almost everybody, uh, right-handers and most left-handed people uh, included, the left side of the brain is concerned with language function. So this is, the left side is relatively specialized for the, for the understanding and production of language, okay? Whereas the right side, generally speaking, is involved in things like spatial representation and attention. To the extent that there is some specialization, this is the relative specialization that's <coughs> present for the two hemispheres. And we see this in, in stroke results and things like that, that if, if, if you have a, a, a stroke on the left side, it is much more likely to be inhibitory of, of, of language ability than if this stroke is on the right side. You may have a, a fairly significant piece of damage of other kinds of cognition, but language is still uh, uh, fully available. Precisely right. So, um, so that's the left-right. Turns out there's also a front-back division of the central nervous system. In general, the back portion of the brain, in fact, actually this extends all the way down the nervous system, but the back portion of the brain is sort of the input side. This is where information comes in, sensation and perception, okay? Whereas the front part of the brain is the output side. This is action, motor output, movement, things like that, okay? So generally, back part, information coming in, front part of the nervous system of the brain, output things going back out. Which again. helps to explain this weird thing that your eyes down here, the, 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 the signals come back here to get processed first and then, then kind of work their way, way, way forward. Okay. So generally, turns out there's a third division which is of interest to neuroscientists more than perhaps to this audience, but that it turns out that there's a top-bottom division between representation of the identity of things versus representation of the location of things. Probably less relevant to this audience. Then uh, moving on to like the final dichotomy or the final division, um, and this is one that uh, I added in at Oliver's request, is that there's also, um, you can contrast between the cortical or the outer layer and uh, function of the brain and what are called the subcortical structures, which is a, a, a grab bag term for a lot of structures that I haven't talked about so far. We can talk about in here the, the brain stem, the amygdala, the hypothalamus, the nucleus accumbens. These are all structures that you're gonna hear about a little bit uh, over the next few days. So we can talk about this outer, cortical surface of the brain, and then sort of these more deeper inner pieces, okay? And, and where would the hippocampus be in here? Because again, on memory formation, that's, that's an important Yeah, so the hippocampus is right in around here. This okay. is the hippocampal structure, which is, uh, it's technically cortex and not subcortex, but the subcortical structure, but anyway. Um, so, but generally, you can think about the outer cortical surfaces of the brain, and then these sort of inner uh, nuclei or uh, portions of the brain which have little specialized functions interior, okay? And some of these include the amygdala and the hypothalamus. Which and, and I will, will particularly uh, put a little, little pin on the amygdala. Um, amygdala involved in, in, in the kind of things that we identify as emotion. Note how I phrase that. Um, 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 and uh, uh, attention and a bunch, bunch of things like that. So, so uh, that's, that's a structure you'll, you'll come back to again. Perfect. And actually, so that's an awful lot of detail. Here's the takeaway I want you to have. Just that there is regional specialization for mental function. Okay? So that different areas of the brain have some regional specialization for different kinds of mental operations. And it's, it, there's a lawful and very reproducible set of these associations. It's not anything could be anywhere. There are certain uh, definite, very well-established relationships. And I would, would put just a pin on his wor word some, because what, one of the things you also discover is that very few mental operations are so completely localized that you can say there is the spot for. Early, early neuroscience talked about the spot for. That's right. We now know better than that. It's not a spot for, but, but a, a certainly a concentration of, of, of importance. Is yeah. in, in fact, one can trace through sort of the history of neuroscience, a tension between uh, a localization type understanding of the brain, like this is the piece that does this and this is the piece that does this, versus an emphasis more on sort of the, the global um, organization or distribution of information across the entire brain. And b both stances uh, have an awful lot to recommend them. So you can both view mental operations as being distributed and uh, taking place across the entire or very broad areas of the, of the cortex in the brain, and some mental operations and aspects of mental operations that are specialized and local. And that's a tension that uh, exists in the representation of this kind of uh, organization of the brain throughout neuroscientific history. I'd like to actually put this kind of uh, fairly restrained description of uh, the specialization and organization of the brain in contrast to a couple of things. I just want to get these out of here. 
oh, we only use 10% of our brain, or hey, I'm creative, so I'm right-brained, or you know, my friend from college is so artistic, she must be very left-brained, or I don't even know what these are. I just want to tell you, these are not sort of concepts which have any kind of, um, uh, or d d play no serious role in neuroscientific descriptions or discussions of the organization of the brain, okay? So let's, let's get rid of those guys, okay? We actually, they, we don't only use 10% of our brain. It isn't the case that we, we can meaningfully talk about some people as being left-brained or some people as being right-brained. These are, these are notions that actually don't play a part in uh, major neuroscientific theories of the organization of the brain. Yep. I was just going to say that we're using lots of our brain all the time, uh, which is part of what, what makes some of the kinds of studies you'll see interesting and hard to do. Yeah. Okay, so finally, 